Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Mostly Sci-Fi 2. My name is Mostly Sci-Fi and I'm your host. Please like and subscribe. And if you can, um, donate to the Patreon. We already got one Patreon. Very good. Uh, I'm very happy about that. Hopefully I can get a second one. Uh, we got these tiers here. As you can see, Newt, William Hudson, Vasquez, Jones, Ripley. And I'll leave the link in the comment section. So if you can, please donate um, to that. And also, if you can, um, you can actually donate to the, uh, they have the thanks here. Well, not in this one, but if, because I'm using my computer now, but they also have the, the little thanks right here and you can drop a donation there. It really helps me. Like I said, I wanted to do this full time because I love doing this. I love um, just reading and talking about science fiction. So um, today, uh, what we, oh, before that, before we even get into what we're gonna do today, also, um, please check out the, um, the playlist right here. Um, I, I just put out something for Bud Hopkins intruders. So that was, I think that was chapter six. That was like a couple of days ago. And also, uh, if you keep checking back, I'm going to have another alien revival edition. That's going to be chapter five. Uh, I haven't been around because I've been busy doing this stuff. Cause I have to, to, um, screenshot everything. I have to do all the, get all the cells, and it's over like 70 or 80 cells. I also have to do the recordings of the, the voice acting and everything, and then inserting all the sound effects and the music. So that has taken me a while. That usually takes me like two weeks to do just one chapter. Okay, so um, that should be out maybe, today is a Saturday, I think, right? So that should be out like by next Friday, hopefully, hopefully before Friday, if, if I keep to the schedule. Okay. So that's going to be out and yeah. So anyway, today we're doing another deep analysis dive into, um, aliens bug hunt. So this is going to be the third story. And I think I'm not doing it in order of the ones I like or dislike or whatever, what have you. It's just um, stuff that I found pretty, the, the stories that I found pretty interesting. Okay, so we're gonna be doing Exterminators by Mark Forbeck. And we're gonna be listening to that. And I also have basically a Corona, like a mini Corona. And um, we are going to be enjoying this story. So let's do it. So um, Exterminators is a 2017 story written by Matt Forbeck, published by Titan Books as part of the anthology of Aliens Bug Hunt, a prequel to Aliens. It sees Corporal Dietrich and Private Frost finding themselves surrounded and cut off by voracious, 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 oh, I cannot say it, voracious insectoid aliens while AWOL in an illegal bar on a backwater planet. So they AWOL, I guess they ran away from some duty or something like that. I'm gonna click on Dietrich to see if this. Okay, so. Um, Corporal Cynthia Dietrich was a hospital corpsman with the United States Colonial Marine Corps, Corp, part of the 2nd Battalion Bravo team. She was a member of the combat unit deployed. She was a member of the combat unit deployed to LV-426 aboard the USS Sulaco in 2079 uh, to investigate the sudden loss of contact with the Holland colony of Hadley's Hope. So she died in there, I remember that. 
She was subsequently involved in combating the xenomorph infestation at the colony. Dietrich was part of the second squad rifle team along with Private Frost. She was taken uh, by the aliens during the early stages of the operation and was most likely sub subsequently impregnated with a chest burster. Okay, so uh, so she was part of the the expedition to oh wow okay of aliens okay so this is Rico Frosty Frost Private First Class Rico Frost nicknamed Frosty of the Zen Master owing to his cool attitude was a member of the United States Colonial Marine Corps part of the 2nd Battalion Bravo team he was a member of the blah 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 right um, Frost is part of the 2nd Squad's rifle team along with Corporal Dietrich and was also a skilled martial artist holding a first degree black belt in the Marine Corps martial arts program he was killed by friendly fire inside the hive when Dietrich accidentally set him alight with her flamethrower. Exterminators by Matt Forbeck Corporal Cynthia Dietrich and Private First Class Rico Frost stumbled into the last chance like drunken rhinos, shaking off the hot rain as if they'd just emerged from a boiling river. Almost every other head in the main room of the backwater saloon all four of them, spun to glare at the two marines with undisguised disgust. The grizzled bartender, who looked like he might have come with the ancient prefab place when it was new, was the only exception. Fuck, Frost said as he wiped off his face. It's hotter than hell out there. What'll it be, ladies? The bartender said, splaying both hands on the rough surface of the chipboard bar before him. Frost squinted at the man, trying to make out his face in the darkened place, lit only by flickering ad signs for liquor and beer and a guttering gas lamp. After a moment, he decided who the barkeep was didn't matter. He didn't know him. Hell, he and Dietrich didn't know anyone on this entire soaking wet ball of shit. Tequila, Dietrich barked out with a grin. All of it. The pair held on to each other for support as they made their way to the bar and planted themselves on top of a couple of rickety stools. The bartender produced a couple plastic shot glasses and filled them with a clear liquid from a labelless bottle. Frost wrinkled his nose at it. He couldn't say if it was tequila or not, but at this point, he didn't think it mattered much. Whatever its name, it was potent enough to do the trick. He plucked up one of the giant plastic thimbles and Dietrich did the same. They tapped their shot glasses together and then slammed back the contents in one go. Both marines howled as the liquor burned its way down their throats, then collapsed against each other, laughing. They slapped their empty shot glasses down on the bar, still chuckling. Frost finally glanced about to see who they were sharing the bar with, and he saw only grim faces staring back at them. He tapped Dietrich on the shoulder and gestured toward the others with his chin. Well... What the hell's wrong with you people? Dietrich said, still smiling. You two ought to get the hell out of here, a black man with graying hair and beard said with a snarl. What? Frost said, determined not to let the man bring him or Dietrich down. But we just got here. We've been trapped on a slow transport from the Outer Rim for the past six months, and we have a shitload of accumulated steam to blow off. Let him be, Jesse. A fat, bald, white man cradling his hand in his lap and sitting next to the black man said, It's already too late. You don't know that, Tim, the black man said. They're young, fit, soldiers. They start running right now, they might still have a chance. Frost glanced at Dietrich. Neither one of them liked how these men were talking. They'd run into some real jackasses in bars before, but they hadn't been expecting any trouble here. Sullivan 9 was a remote refueling station with damn little to offer anyone but a steady supply of fuel. Oxygen, hydrogen, even propane and wood, and a drink or three to warm visitors on their way. And they hadn't even been able to find that in the main building where they'd left the rest of their platoon. 
They'd had to bribe one of the station attendants for the directions to this place so they could slip away to it. She hadn't wanted to give it up to them, but Dietrich was a heavy tipper. Long as there's still drink here, we're not going anywhere, Dietrich said, her voice loud enough to make sure everyone in the room heard it. Or until the captain comes looking for us, Frost said with a chortle. He looked at the bartender and gave his shot glass a meaningful tap. The bartender filled it up and did the same for Dietrich. Come on, Birdo, Jesse said. They don't need to die here with the rest of us. Ain't no one dying here today, the bartender said. He left the bottle there in front of them and sneered at Jesse. Either way, I'm doing my job. You ought to try to do the same. Fuck the job, Jesse said. They don't pay any of us enough for shit like this. You want to leave? Birdo said. There's the door. Jesse eyed the exit, but instead of making a move for it, he took a slug of his beer and wiped his mouth on his grimy sleeve. We'd never make it. What the hell are you gas gulpers going on about? Dietrich said. You're creeping me out. Birdo hemmed and hawed for a moment. You shouldn't have come here. It's not safe. Frost had never been one to let anyone... So it's, it seems like the bartender and like another one or two people are on some kind of desolated space station and they're trapped. And, you know, what gets me is that they seem to be so nonchalant about it. So when I first heard this story, I just thought like, well, why are they so nonchalant, you know? It should be terrified, basically. Unintimidate him, and he wasn't about to let some backwater bartender manage it now. He slapped his hand on the table to get the man's attention, gave him his best, you'd better not be threatening me, Glare, and spat one word at him. Why? Birdo couldn't meet Frost's eyes. He just grimaced at Tim and Jesse and said, Show them. The two men pushed their chairs to the side and stood up. At the far side of the table behind them sat another man, face down. He had been so quiet the entire time that Frost had assumed he was just a passed-out drunk as the Marines soon hoped to be. Tim reached over and grabbed the man's cap by its bill and pushed his limp form back into a sitting position. The man's head lolled back and his button-down shirt fell open, revealing what looked like an armored jacket underneath. Dietrich stared at the man while Frost coughed a harsh laugh at Berto. You trying to tell us this piss you've been slinging at us isn't safe to drink? The bartender shook his head. Take a good look at him. He ain't drunk. Holy shit, Dietrich whispered. What the fuck happened to him? Frost had rarely heard Dietrich sound so serious, and it stopped him cold in the middle of concocting a snarky retort for Berto. He got up from his stool instead and took a few cautious steps toward the quiet man. He was an Asian man with wide reddish cheeks and streaks of gray slicing through his shock of hair. His face had fallen slack and a layer of sweat covered his skin. His eyes sat open, but the irises had rolled back up into his head. Is he dead? Jesse shook his head. Not yet anyway. Frost crept closer. There was something odd about the armor the man wore on his chest. He'd never seen anything like it before. It looked hard, chitinous even, but it didn't cover his entire chest, just the front of his undershirt. He didn't see how the thin straps coming out on six sides of the armor could keep it attached to the man's chest. They didn't go all that far. Then he gasped. The armor didn't have straps. It had legs. Frost stepped back toward the bar and tapped his empty shot glass. Birdo filled it all the way to the rim and did the same for Dietrich, too. Frost slammed back his shot, and Birdo refilled it without being asked. What is that thing? Frost asked. Tim shook his head. We don't know. Park here staggered outside after having his regular nightcap and just started screaming. 
We came out to help him and we found him like this. What the fuck? Dietrich said. Why'd you bring him back here then instead of to the main station? They got an infirmary there, right? Tim pointed at the thing on Park's chest. There were more of these things out there in the dark. Don't know how many, but enough we didn't want to try to carry him through it. Frost groaned. And you couldn't just have called for help? Birdo snorted. This looked like a legal place to you. You think we got comm lines installed? Jesse shook his head with regret. Shocks me every day that Wayland yutani hasn't shut us down yet. Well, you can't just leave him like that, Dietrich said. Get it off him! Tim held up the hand he'd been favoring. The fingers on it were as red as if the skin had started to melt off them. Tried that, he said. Didn't go so well. Frost could now recognize the strain in the man's voice. It hadn't been from having intruders in the bar, but from the agonizing pain he'd been trying to hide. I tried to pull it off with my bare hands, and it set Park screeching like a gutted monkey. Figured that meant I was doing something right, so I dug my fingers in around that thing's edge and pulled. It used some kind of acid to glue itself to Park's chest, Jesse said. Shit spurred out with a gout of Park's blood and did that to Tim's hand. And you didn't go run for help? Dietrich said agog. Are you fucking insane? Tim slumped back down in his chair. We didn't get ten meters before those things cut us off. We ran right back here. That was three hours ago. We've been trying to figure out what to do ever since. And then we walked in, Frost said with a low groan. And now you're stuck here with us, Jesse said. I didn't see anything out there while we were running through the rain, Dietrich said. Maybe those things are gone now. Frost strode toward the door and hauled it open on its squeaky hinges. The rain still pounded down out of the night sky, warm as blood. He squinted into the blackness, unable to see much but the lights of the refueling station in the distance. Their ship sat somewhere beyond it entirely out of sight. It wasn't that long of a walk to the station, he knew, but it seemed light years away. The captain, Frost suspected, wouldn't come looking for them until morning. Hell, up until now, he'd been relying on it. I got a bad feeling about this. You always say that, Dietrich pushed past his shoulder. See anything? Frost shook his head. The light that hung over the bar's door only illuminated the ground beneath it and the massive propane tank out front that powered the bar. The rest of the area stood shrouded in soaking wet darkness. Lightning flashed, and Frost spotted something rustling along the open rocky landscape, just out of range of the bar's outside light. At first he thought it might be leaves, something like giant palm fronds rustling in the wind but despite the rain, the air remained still. There, he pointed it out to Dietrich. What's that? Dietrich leaned forward to peer into the darkness. Thunder rumbled. Close. Lightning flashed again, and this time Frost got a better look at them. They weren't leaves. They were large insects. Lots of them, swarming over each other. Frost pulled a small flashlight out of his pocket and pointed it toward the things he'd seen. Its bright light lanced through the darkness and caught the pile of bugs in its beam. They scattered from the brightness, looking for someplace dark to hide. Some of them just ran away, while others disappeared into fissures in the ground. In an instant, they were gone. Dietrich leaped backward, her hand over her mouth to stifle a scream, and Frost slammed shut the door. They're just bugs, Frost said as he held Dietrich's shoulders to help calm her. It's no big deal. That's what Park thought, Jesse said. Now look at him. Frost refused to. He turned to Berto instead. It's safe in here, right? He said. We can just wait them out. Someone will come looking for us eventually. Maybe, Tim said. As long as those things out there don't get them too. You got a better plan? Frost wished he and Dietrich had brought their weapons with them. 
It was one thing to sneak out of the ship to go on a bender, though, and something far worse to do it while fully armed. They'd left everything they'd had back in ship. Tim just stared at the floor. Jesse shrugged at the Marines. Not like we had anything better to do. That's why we were here in the first place. Right, Frost motioned to Birdo. I'd like to buy a round for the house. The bartender waved Frost off, but he put the bottle of supposed tequila out on the bar anyhow. Forget it, he said. We're past worrying about payment at this point. Very kind of you, Dietrich said as she reached for the bottle. While she topped off the two shot glasses on the bar, Berto produced four more and she filled them too. Frost picked up two of the shot glasses and brought them over to Jesse and Tim. Despite the fear his hands might start shaking, he didn't spill a single drop. Berto knocked back one of the remaining shots himself and then gazed at the other. Who's that for? Dietrich said. Berto nodded toward Park. He ain't dead yet. <laughs> Frost came back to the bar and scooped up the extra shot. He walked it over to the unconscious man and set it on the table in front of him. I don't think he's in the drinking mood. Maybe, Tim said as he picked up the shot. But you never know until you try. Using his good hand, Tim waved the shot under Park's nose, letting the pungent odor of the crude alcohol waft up out of the glass at him. Come on, pal, he said. You know you want it. To everyone's surprise... Park's entire body twitched. Tim leaped back, spilled the shot all over Park. Shit, he said, son of a bitch. Park's head moved now, and his eyes rolled forward. He gazed out at the others, struggling to focus on them. Jesse patted Park on the shoulder. It's all right, man, he said in an even, steady voice. We got you back inside. Park tried to sit up straight but the shell on his chest stopped him. He looked down at it, confused and unable to comprehend it. He opened his mouth to complain about it, but nothing came out. We're stuck in here, Jesse told Park. We want to get you to a doctor, but I think we're going to have to wait until daybreak. Park tried to speak again, but failed. His face contorted in frustration, and tears welled up in his eyes. Frost wanted to go talk with him, but with the state Park was in, Frost didn't know how the man would react to a stranger approaching him. And if he was honest with himself, the thing on the man's chest terrified him. Tim stood next to Park and tried to comfort him. It's gonna be alright, he said. Frost suspected no one in the room believed him. Park reached out and squeezed Tim's good hand. The human contact calmed him, and he took a deep breath to steady himself. For a moment, he seemed like he might be all right. Then Park began to cough. It started out low at first, as if the man was only clearing his throat. Jesse reached around and patted him on his back. Soon, though, Park's distress became worse, developing into a hacking cough. It seemed to become more and more painful every time he flinched forward, hunching over the shell of the creature still attached to his chest, we need to get him to a doctor, Frost said. Now. You gonna try to move him like this? Tim said. Then we need to go get a doctor, Dietrich said as she stepped toward the door. Frost followed her. What about those things out there? Dietrich shrugged. We don't know how fast they are, right? We just run flat out for the station and maybe they don't catch us. In that downpour, Berto said. What if you slip? They'll be on you in a heartbeat. Frost decided that didn't matter. If this was their only shot, they had to take it. They couldn't just let Park die. He threw the door open and put an arm around Dietrich. Ready? Dietrich nodded, and the pair steeled themselves for their mad dash up a rocky path in a hot, thick rain. They'd done things like this before, on planets so far away from there, sometimes with bullets zipping past them. Frost told himself this had to be easier, safer even, right? <laughs> Before they could take their first step outside, though, Park threw back his head and screamed. Ah. Dietrich spun away from the door and Frost followed suit, slamming it closed. In the far corner of the bar,
Park sat in his chair, his back arched as if someone had stabbed him. Jesse sat on one side of him, Tim on the other. Both See, what he should have done is when, Park, when that happened with Park, he should have threw him outside and then closed the door. But, of course, that's his friend, so. <clears throat> but staring at their friend, helpless. What's happening? Dietrich said, her voice rising in panic. No one answered. Park stopped screaming and began to buck up and down in his chair, as if he was being electrocuted. Stop him, Berto said to Tim and Jesse. Grab him and stop him before he hurts himself. The two men did as ordered, each taking Park by one arm. It was all they could do to keep the man from flinging himself to the floor. After a long moment, Park stopped contorting and slumped back down in his chair. Park looked to his friends as if he meant to thank them, but instead of words, blood began to pour from his mouth. Dear God, Tim said. Despite the man's terror, both he and Jesse kept hold of Park. Frost couldn't tell if they intended to or were just so shocked they'd forgotten they had the option of letting go. Mm -hmm. Park began to gurgle then, a horrible sound that burbled up through the blood. He leaned over the table, the crimson fluid spilling from his mouth as his stomach heaved harder and harder. Nothing but the blood came out, at least at first. The heaves didn't stop, though. They kept coming, harder and faster, until Frost was surprised the man's stomach hadn't erupted from his mouth. Park lurched forward so hard, he would have crashed his face into the table if his friends hadn't been holding him back. As he did, Something dark and slimy began to pour from his mouth, muffling his agonized gurgling. Frost took an involuntary step back. When he saw Dietrich remained frozen in fright, he reached forward and pulled her to stand at his side. Mm -hmm. Oh shit, Berto said. Shit, 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 shit. Park continued to vomit, heaving forward over and over again. Every time he did, more things spilled from his face, so many that Frost wondered where they could have all possibly come from. Hmm. The pile they formed spread slowly across the table, covering it, some of them spilling onto the floor. Smashed those things. Frost had seen many strange things in his life, but he'd never felt so disgusted. And then the things Park had vomited began to move. Frost hated himself for it, but he let out a little squeal of disgust. It wasn't any louder than Tim's, though, and not nearly so long. Jesse and Tim let go of Park, leaped out of their chairs, and staggered away in shock. As they did, Park flung himself backward with one final convulsion. His chair toppled over and cracked from the impact. The things on the table continued to crawl off it in a slimy cataract that spilled onto the floor. From there, the fist-sized creatures scuttled in every direction. Some of them headed straight for Frost and Dietrich. Dietrich grabbed Frost's arm and pulled him toward the door. We gotta go, she said. We gotta run. Wait. Frost yanked free from Dietrich's grasp and pulled out his flashlight again. He shined the beam at the creatures and instantly recognized them for what they were. Those are the same things we saw outside. The insects scattered at the touch of the light, scurrying away from the beam as fast as their little legs would take them. Some of them started crawling up Tim and Jesse, working their way up their pants. The men began howling and stomping about in stark terror. Frost played the beam over the men, moving it from one to the other. At the same time, he tried to keep an eye on the strays coming his way, emboldened by the fact the light no longer touched them instead. It's too much, Frost said. I can't stop them all. Over and over again, he flicked the light from Tim to Jesse and back to the floor between him and the insects. He could never keep the beam in one place long enough to really drive the creatures away. If he kept it focused in any one spot for too long, the bugs surged forward everywhere else. Frost wanted to save Tim and Jesse, who had resorted to brushing the insects off themselves with their bare hands. Where the creatures touched their bare skin, they left burns, and the men yelped about them in pain and terror. Lights? Dietrich shouted at Berto. We need lights! The bartender reached under the bar and twisted something with a loud squeak. The guttering gaslight that hung in the middle of the ceiling and had barely provided any illumination or warmth burst into fully fueled brightness. The bugs fled, 
Many of them leapt from Jesse and Tim, and in mid-air, they spread their wings from beneath their shells and took flight, clicking and clattering as they went. They can fly? Dietrich said. Not fair. Just huddle here under the Game light, over, Frost said, as much Game to Dietrich over. as everyone else in the bar. They won't touch us here. Jesse and Tim made their way there, spinning about as they did, making sure the creatures couldn't hide in their shadows. They knocked a few of the insects toward the others, but Frost scared them away with his flashlight. Within moments, the four of them stood safe under the hissing gaslight. Ow, Jesse said. That fucking hurt. He and Tim were covered with red welts where the alien creatures had attacked them. Frost couldn't tell if they were bites, stings, or something else, but each of the wounds was about the size of a pool ball and looked painfully red and raw. Jesse had taken one over his right eye and was holding a hand over it. Blood trickled between his fingers. I think they're gone, Dietrich said. For now, said Tim. Little fuckers. What about Park? Jesse said. We should check on him. He's dead already, Dietrich said. Forget him. Together they stared at the table that now stood between them and where Park had fallen. We can't just leave him like that, Tim said. Yeah. It ain't right. <laughs> Neither is having a swarm of cockroaches come flying out of your face, Dietrich said. Nothing about this is right. Give me that flashlight. Tim put his hand out toward Frost. If you're all too scared, I'll go take a look. Frost stared at Tim's empty hand. He knew one thing. As scared as he was of these creatures, the bugs, he wasn't going to give up the one thing he had he knew worked against them. No matter what. Forget it, he said. I'll go. We'll all go. Dietrich said. We just need to move that table out of the way, Jesse said. He took his hand away from his eye. It had swollen shut tight. Jeez. Right, Frost said. Any volunteers? Jesse didn't say a word. He just darted forward and pushed the table to one side, hard and fast. As he did, a few more insects fluttered out from underneath it. So he turned the damn thing over, exposing its underside to the light. A dozen more insects fled for the darkness. This time, Frost followed them with the flashlight's beam to see where they went. Hmm. They made their way toward the walls and disappeared by slipping into the cracks near the floor, squeezing through spaces that seemed impossibly thin. Bring that light over here, Jesse said as he creeped toward Parks' corpse. Frost angled off to the side and shined his light past Jesse. What he saw made him swallow hard to keep down his liquor. The creature that had been attached to Park's chest had fallen off. It lay to one side of him. Nothing left of it now but an empty shell that gleamed in the light. Park's torso below where the shell had been attached sat splayed open, as if something had flayed all the flesh off it, exposing the bones and organs beneath. Dietrich turned aside and threw up on the floor. They goddamn ate him from the inside, Birdo said. Looking closer, Frost saw that the bartender was right. Most of Park's intestines were missing, and the bottom had been torn out of his stomach. We gotta get out of here, Dietrich said after spluttering the foul taste from her mouth. We can't stay. What, with all those things out there? Birdo said. Hmm. How are we gonna get past them? Game over, Maybe man. they ran off already, <laughs> Frost said. He turned toward the door, happy to have any excuse to pull himself away from looking at Parks' corpse for another second. We can at least check. Frost held the flashlight in front of him and pulled the door open with his free hand. He shined his beam outside, right into the area beyond the pool of light around the door. There were more of the bugs out there than ever before. Most of them were smaller, like the ones that had come out of Park but there seemed to be many more of them than could have come from the man. Several larger ones scuttled among them, moving like giants among toddlers. <laughs> They've cut off the path, Frost said. There's no way to get through them. We have to try, don't we? Dietrich said. So we stomp on a few alien insects on our way. Good for us. Did you see how fast those fuckers can fly? Jesse said. There's no way you can outrun them. 
We don't have a choice, Tim shouted as he came up behind the others. We need more lights, Frost said. Do you have any more flashlights around here? Birdo gave him a grim shake of his head. What else can we use? Got a lighter? Matches? Birdo reached behind the bar and pulled out a large box of safety matches. Sometimes the pilot light goes out and I have to relight it. Those won't make it through the rain, Jesse said. And they don't make enough light anyhow, Tim said. No, but we can use them to light torches, right? Birdo barked a high-pitched, nervous laugh. Mm -hmm. I'm fresh out of those. But we can make torches. Frost glanced around the room. Bust up a chair or table and use the legs. Wrap the end in a bar rag soaked in that shit you call tequila. Hmm. Dietrich frowned. How long you think that'll last? Longer than a fucking match, at least. Hmm. But how long is it going to take us to make enough torches? Tim said. What? Frost said. Are you going anywhere until we do? <laughs> Tim gave him a shrug of his shoulders that said, fair enough. It was then that the gaslight went out. Worse than that, though, was the scritching sound that began coming from every corner of the bar as the insects began to work their way back inside. Frost wasn't sure who screamed the loudest. It might have been him, but he was the first to come to his senses. They must have chewed through the gas line, Frost said. They're bugs, said Birdo. How can they be smart enough to do that? Frost didn't care to argue the point. The evidence was in his favor. He flicked his flashlight back on, and in its light he grabbed the bottle of tequila off the bar. As fast as he could, he poured the liquor out on the floor in a wide circle around Dietrich, Tim, Jesse, and himself. It was then that Birdo, who was still standing behind the bar, started to scream. This time not simply in terror, but also in pain. Quick, Frost said to Dietrich, light me one of those matches. He wanted to turn the light on Berto and help him out, but he couldn't. Not yet. If he did, he'd be condemning the rest of them to a painful death. He just hoped the bartender could hold out just a little longer. Dietrich struck the match against the side of the box and it burst into flame. Her hands were shaking so badly, though, she dropped it. It went out as it hit the floor. She grabbed another, spilling several of the rest of the matches on the floor. Cursing, she ignored them and struck the second match. This one she managed to hold on to, and she touched it to the booze Frost had spilled about the place. A blazing ring of fire burst up around them. The alien insects that had already started crowding around them skittered away from the heat and light. Some of them had been standing in the alcohol when it went up and had been set on fire. They squealed and hissed as they baked inside their shells. A few of the critters had made it inside the circle too, but Jesse and Tim kicked them back over the line. Frost turned the flashlight back toward Birdo, but he wasn't there. The flickering light from the few beer signs in the bar didn't give much in the way of illumination, certainly not enough to frighten off the creatures, but Frost was sure Berto hadn't run past them somehow. He had to still be there with them. Frost splashed some of the tequila on the bar and used it to make a line back to the ring of fire. It ignited, and the fire followed the line backward to the top of the bar. Birdo leaped up from behind the bar, desperate to immerse himself in the light. The creatures covered every inch of him that Frost could see, Jeez. biting his flesh, trying to crawl into his mouth. He fell into the pool of burning tequila and embraced the bar like a drowning man grasping a life preserver. The insects on the upper part of his body fled, but they didn't go far. They just moved down his body, out of the fire, out of the light. With the creatures now away from his face, Birdo opened his mouth and let out a horrifying howl of agony. His shirt had already caught on fire, but he did nothing to extinguish it. Instead, he crawled up onto the bar and immolated himself in the blaze. The smell of burning flesh filled the air, and Frost gagged at the sickly scent. We have to save him, Jesse said. How? Tim said. It's too late for him. What about us? Fuck you and fuck this. Jesse stormed forward and tried to grab Birdo by his shoulders. The flames proved too hot for him to handle, though, and he fell back, his fingers already blistering. Shit, he said. Shit! 
Birdo had already stopped screaming. As the others watched, his body, no longer grasping at the edge of the bar, slipped backward and tumbled out of sight. Jesse made to go after Birdo once again, but Frost grabbed him by the back of his shirt to stop him. Forget it, he said. He's gone. For an instant, Frost wondered if Jesse would cold cock him right then and there and go after Birdo. The man seemed to realize the pointlessness of it, though, and his shoulders sagged in defeat. The chipboard surface of the bar had caught fire by now, and the flames began to spread. Well, that'll drive the bugs out, Tim said. And us along with it, said Dietrich. We need to get out of here. Goddamn right, Frost said. If those things chewed through the gas line, you know what that means? Shit, said Jesse. It's leaking. If it reaches that fire or the other way around, we're done for. We're done for out there, too, Tim said. There's no way we can make it to the station from here. Speak for yourself, Dietrich said. We don't have to outrun those things, old man. We just have to outrun you. Hmm. Fuck you. You go fuck whatever you want, Dietrich said. This whole place could blow up any second. We're leaving. Come with us or die in a fire here. Your choice. Hmm. She's right, Jesse said. We need to go. Now. What about torches? Tim said. We don't have time to make them, Dietrich said. We run for the door, smash through it, and keep running until we find the lights of the station or die trying. Tim groaned, but Jesse put a stop to that. Can you come up with a better plan in the next five seconds? No? Then let's go. Tim glared at Jesse for a full three seconds before he nodded his assent. All right. Frost hefted his flashlight in one hand and the still half-full bottle of tequila in the other. On three. One. Tim bolted for the door. Shocked, Frost and Dietrich watched him go. Jesse recovered first and chased after his friend. As the two locals reached the door, Dietrich pushed Frost from behind, and the two Marines started after them. Hey! Tim and Jesse ignored Dietrich's protest and slipped out the door. Frost charged through it himself, and someone, he couldn't tell who, punched him in the side of the head as he emerged into the hot rain. Frost fell forward, skidding into the steaming mud on his chest. As he hit the ground, he could smell the telltale scent of propane wafting around him, combined with the taste of failure. His flashlight tumbled out of his hand, the light flipping between earth and sky until it landed several feet away. Frost could see Jesse's face by the beam of the flashlight as he scooped it up. Sorry, the man said in a heartfelt way. Then he charged off toward the station without a moment's more hesitation, Damn. racing along in Tim's footprints. Frost felt someone's hand on his shoulder and spun about, ready for a fight. It was Dietrich, though, who hadn't abandoned him. Are you all right? She said. We gotta move. That's messed up. As Frost scrambled to his feet, he watched his flashlight's beam shrink smaller and smaller by the second. We're never going to catch them. We have to try, Dietrich said. As the words left her mouth, though, a man, Jesse, maybe, shouted out in the night. Hmm. Another voice joined him soon after. A moment later, the flashlight's shrunken beam tumbled to the ground and went out. Hmm. Oh, shit, Dietrich said through her hand as she stared into the darkness. We are so, so fucked. Frost winced in a shaken cocktail of shame and pain. He'd let those men trick him and now he and Dietrich would pay for it with their lives. Wait, Dietrich said. I still have those matches. Do you have the tequila? Frost held up the bottle. By some miracle, he'd managed to keep hold of it as he fell, and he'd barely lost a drop of it. What good's that going to do? Dietrich didn't respond. Instead, she produced the matchbox and fished a fresh match from it. Then she set to lighting it. The first attempt failed as did the second. Frost could hear the crawling little aliens out there, chittering in the rain. Were they talking with each other? Coordinating their plan of attack? He couldn't tell. He just knew the men were still screaming. It would only be a matter of time before the bugs finished the locals off, though, and came crawling after the marines. Dietrich huddled in close to Frost, and they covered the matchbox with their heads. 
This time, the match flared to glaring life. Dietrich took the match and dropped it into the bottle of tequila. The liquor erupted into a blue flame that licked its way up and out of the bottle. Yep. What the hell good is that? Frost said. A lamp. Throw it at the tank? Dietrich said. Frost goggled at her. There's a leak near the tank, he said. I can smell it. So can I. This could blow it all up. Dietrich reached out and took Frost by the hand. Beats being eaten by those little bastards, doesn't it? Frost stared at the tank sitting there in front of the bar. Then he glanced back toward where he'd seen the locals fall. One of them had already stopped screaming. He couldn't tell which, but he didn't suppose it mattered. He leaned over and gave Dietrich a kiss. Then he cocked his arm back and hurled the flaming bottle of tequila at the leaking propane tank with every bit of strength he could muster. The glass bottle shattered against the steel tank, splashing burning alcohol all over it. The tank exploded. The shockwave knocked Frost and Dietrich flat. The last thing Frost remembered as he went flying backward through the air was watching a gigantic fireball erupt from the tank and light up the night sky. Frost woke up in a hospital bed the next day, in some distant building he'd never seen, where things were clean and white. Dietrich lay in the bed next to him, still unconscious. It seemed she'd put herself between Frost and the explosion and taken the brunt of it. The nurses weren't sure if she'd make it. You never know, one of them said to Frost. She's a fighter. Later, the captain came by to ask Frost what had happened, and he told her everything. A pair of representatives from Wayland yutani stopped by too, mm -hmm. and Frost repeated his account for them. None of them seemed to believe a word of it. The captain took particularly detailed notes as she grilled Frost without relenting. When they were finally done, the captain said to him, You've had a horrible experience. You and Dietrich almost died in that explosion. It's not surprising your brain would create impossible memories like this to explain what happened. Fuck you. The captain gave him a sympathetic nod. I'll ask the doctor to prescribe you a sedative. Later, once everyone had left Frost alone with his thoughts, he actually began to wonder about his sanity. Maybe Birdo had given them some bad tequila. Maybe the concussion he'd sustained had scrambled his brain. Maybe he actually had hallucinated the whole thing. He just couldn't tell anymore. Yet it had seemed so real. Soon after, Frost forced himself out of bed and hobbled over to sit next to Dietrich and hold her hand. He didn't know if it meant anything to her while she was out cold like that, but it comforted him. I bet you she got one of those things on her chest. I bet you. Let's see. For the moment, that was enough. Frost was almost falling asleep himself when Dietrich finally opened her eyes. She could barely breathe still, just enough to squeeze a few words out of her scorched lungs. We get him? Okay. Dietrich croaked. She sounded like a three-packs-a-day smoker. What? Frost startled at the abrupt sound. Who? Dietrich stared back at Frost through watery eyes. The bugs. We kill all those fuckers? As many as we could, Frost said. Enough, anyway. Dietrich gave him a wide smile, and before she closed her eyes again, she said, Next time we run up against something like that, I'm bringing a fucking flamethrower. Exterminators, how do I feel about it? Um, I thought it was great. I thought it was a great... I'm just letting you listen to the ones that I thought were my favorite. They're not, not in any particular order. I thought that Exterminators was a great addition to um, Aliens Bug Hunt. There's a lot of little things that I didn't even know. So um, after further reading, uh, Dietrich and Frost, because I don't remember all the names. I, you know, you remember like v v Vasquez, right? And you remember like um, Hendrix. I remember like those two 
people. I don't quite remember their names, but I remember they, they had a grenade and they exploded each other. I know there's a story that's, that involves those two. Um, I know they got a book about Vasquez, right? I know they got one about um, Hudson, right? Game over, man, game over. Bill Paxson, he actually died like a couple of years ago, which I was sad about that. I think it was like last year or two years ago, somewhere around that. So um, you have, so you have Frost and Dietrich. So Dietrich actually set her, set her best comrade friend to flames okay and if you didn't see that if you didn't understand that reference it's like the last thing she says is next time i'm bringing a flamethrower right and so she brings a flamethrower to the xenomorphs right on Haley's hope and then she ends up killing her best friend basically frost in friendly fire which is just insane. And so that was kind of crazy. <laughs> I was like, wow. And I think that this should be part of the alien continuum universe. Like some of these stories, maybe not, but this story has to be part of that, right? Because it's so ironic. The other ironic part is that the aliens that they faced again, the first time they, they faced some kind of xenomorph or something, because it seems like animals were also created by the engineers because they also have acid for blood, but it's not as potent as the xenomorph. Story was created like, um, like 2017, all right? You had Prometheus before that, and then in between you had Covenant, and then they spoke more stuff about what David was doing. David was creating all these types of um, creatures, the extras, right? And so the, and you had the extras, like the, the after the movie, you had all this other stuff. And then you had all his blueprints of how he was creating these kind of monsters and stuff, right? After he killed Shaw, he was like creating these kind of like abominations. And so when he was creating these bo abominations, you did see that he was messing with a lot of the flora he was messing with, and he was le messing with a lot of the, the insect, the living things, okay? And what I think is that they connect. They may not be as potent as the xenomorph, but they are quite similar, okay? So you got the, the chest, it's not a chest burster, but it's a, something that attaches to your chest, invades you, it rapes you just like this. The, the face hugger, except that the face hugger goes into, directly into your mouth, this one goes into your chest, right? And so you got the chest burster, right? The one that bursts from the chest. So instead of going to your chest, it goes, instead of going to your mouth, it goes to your chest, and it eats through your chest, and then it inserts these little baby things, right? And they're not as potent, like they easily can be easily killed. Right? All you gotta do is like smash them or set them on fire or, or something like that. And I think this was the earlier works of David. These little flying things, because they got acid for blood, they kind of follow the same anatomy type of, or the same um, mode of operandi to produce. And so I think, because I, I remember seeing this thing with, with David, I don't know, I'm gonna show you at the end of, of this video. I'm gonna try to show you. He had blueprints and stuff, and you can see that he was creating stuff from the local, I guess the local habitat that was on the planet, right? So you don't really know what planet it was. You don't really know. But we know that it's before, with the time that we know, is that it's before or on the Sulaco, they, they go to Headley's Hope. This is before that. They met these kind of uh, vicious animals or what have you. And then at the end, Waylon and Yutani comes to them and pretends like, why did the Waylon and Yutani employees come to them? It's not like they destroyed anything except a crappy bar, right? They wanted to know the information, right? So, 
I think that these things were created by David. This is a, a, a creation of, of David. This is just my hypothesis. I mean, I could be wrong, but come on, acid for blood. He created the xenomorph. Um, yeah, I think this story could be a part of that. But anyway, I rate this story, I would say like a, a 8 out of 10. It was a good story. And uh, until next time, this is Mostly Sci-Fi. Please like and subscribe. If you like this video, give it a thanks, man. You know, I need the money, I'm telling you. I'm living in America. The inflation is going crazy. And, whew, man. So, anyway, this is Mostly Sci-Fi. Well. Mostly. In order to help you unlock my research, I've included detailed illustrations and charts. For the sake of posterity, I've begun with a complete catalogue of the planet's natural life. Such beautiful creatures. Poisonous and vicious by nature. Several local species of flower have immense potential for medicinal harm. Ridley's really interested in biology himself, and so all of the components that go into the alien are things that he drew upon from nature. So while there is something otherworldly about it, there's something very familiar about it as well.